Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming to the museum. Um, we appreciate your interest. And I'd like to introduce to you one of the youngest survivors, Marcel Fashla, who will be kind enough to tell you his story. Thank you, Marcel. I was born Marcel Fashler. I was invited today to speak to you about my experience as a hidden child of the Holocaust. Now, many people refer to hidden children as survivors. I, however, like many others, do not believe that. Oh yes, we are survivors, but we consider ourselves the lucky ones simply because we were never interned in a concentration camp like Elie Wiesel. I'm sure that all of you or some of you have heard of Elie Wiesel. He is a real survivor. He and his father were interned in concentration camps. And it's important to know that he was interned first in Buchenwald and then in Auschwitz, and he saw his father die just before the liberation in 1945. He wrote many books. He was a peace laureate, Nobel Peace Laureate, and he got that in 1986. Has anybody read his book, Night? I think a lot of people have. If you really want to know what life was like in the concentration camp, I certainly urge you to read that. Now, be talk before I talk about my life, I would like to give you some background about my family. My father, Joseph, was born in Jaffa, Palestine, and he was born in 1906, which at that time was part of the Ottoman Empire or the Turkish Empire. You will understand the importance of this later in my presentation. This is the Ottoman Empire. It started in Turkey. They took over the whole of the Balkans down to the Persian Gulf. And then they took North Africa on the Mediterranean all the way down to Egypt and as well as the Arabian Peninsula. And of course, it was part of Jerusalem. That took 500 years, between 1299 and 1923. My father's father, called Gershon, moved his family from Palestine to Berlin, Germany. Why? I have no idea. And if you look at the map, which is Europe, 1939, you will see that Jerusalem or Palestine was in this area here. Now, in 1906, there were no aeroplanes to take you from Palestine to Berlin, which is just there. So he took a steamship from Palestine down the Mediterranean, across Sicily, where you come from, and Corsica and Sardinia, and then ended up in Marseille, a port just here. And then from there, he took the train all the way to Germany. In that. that took three months. Why he did that, I have absolutely no idea. My mother, Hanschen, was born in Berlin in 1915, and she studied to be a dentist. Now, my parents, there they are. I'm sure that all of you have plenty of pictures of mother and father being married. I have the same glasses as he does, if you look at it <laughs> carefully. <laughs> now, during those turbulent times, my mother's brother, Herman, was involved in the anti-fascist movement and distributed anti-fascist literatures on the streets of Berlin. There is my brother, my uncle Hermann, my mother Hanschen, and a young brother called Siegfried or Ziggy. He somehow found out that the Gestapo was after him and he fled to Paris, France, 
where he be became a airplane pilot. The parents went to visit him in Paris, and there is my uncle, Herman, his mother, Chaya, and my mother, Hanschen. I have another picture here, his father, Johann, and that is the handsome uncle. Now look at Johann's moustache, very much like Hitler. It was the fashion at the time. In 1938, he joined the International Brigade and fought in the Spanish Civil War as a pilot. And here is Herman in his airplane. Now notice, and it's very important, notice there is no cockpit, no protection for the flyer whatsoever. And that's why they had to fly extremely low and dangerous, of course, and they used to drop the bombs by hand. That's how old-fashioned war was at that time. Unfortunately, he was shot down and perished and could never find his tomb. Now, the International Brigade consisted of young men. Many of them were Jewish and came from various countries, including the US. They fought against General Franco, who was aligned with Adolf Hitler. And unfortunately, we've never been able to, f we think that he was shot down over a city called Alicante on the Mediterranean. Then Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass happened on November the 9th, 1938. A massive coordinated attack on Jewish owned stores, <coughs> buildings, homes, and synagogues. Windows were smashed and structures set on fire by the Stummabteilung or the paramilitary, as well as the German civilians. The authority looked on and did absolutely nothing. Over a thousand synagogues were burnt and over 7,000 Jewish businesses and homes were destroyed and damaged throughout the German Reich. Just try and imagine thugs storming your house, kicking you out, ransacking it, and then setting it on fire. 7,000 of them. Anyway, after Kristallnacht, and after his son Loeb was rounded up by the Gestapo and disappeared, my grandfather Gershon, his wife, and his remaining three children took a taxi from Berlin in to Belgium and the city of Antwerp. That's 450 miles. That's a long way. If you look at the map, there is Berlin and they took a taxi all the way down to Antwerp, Belgium, which is that little dot there. <coughs> At the same time, my mother's younger brother, Siegfried, or Ziggy for short, was sent to London with a kinder transport, children's transport, under the aus auspices of the Kinder Transport Association. This was a rescue effort which took place nine months before the outbreak of the Second World War, the United Kingdom took approximately 10,000 children, most of them Jewish. He later joined the British Army and fought General Rommel in Egypt and further in North Africa. One month after Kristallnacht, my parents decided that it was time to get out and they paid to get smuggled out of Belgium and ended up in Antwerp. A little anecdote now. They were on the woods just at the border of Germany and Belgium and there was a part of the group, about 15, 20 people. There was a young mother with a baby and the baby was covered by a blanket. As soon as she got into the Belgian side of things, she unraveled the blanket and the baby was gone. 
she had dropped the baby. She was absolutely distraught and immediately went back into Germany to try and find the baby and of course was never heard of since. My mother's parents could not be persuaded to leave Germany believing that the German people would never follow Hitler's extermination decree against the Jews. They were wrong. Here is a picture of Germany and Poland. My grandfather, Johann, was murdered in Buchenwald in 1941, and my grandmother, Chaya, was murdered in Auschwitz-Birkenau the same year. Now we come to me. I was born in Antwerp, in Belgium, on the 3rd of September, 1939, two days after Germany invaded Poland. From the beginning of May 1941 until September 1944, I was a hidden child in a children's home with another number of Jewish children. The home was near the seaside. I was brought at the home at the age of 18 months and left at the age of five year old. An unmarried Christian woman, Mademoiselle Sorel, and her two sisters were running the home. My sister Rose was born in 1943 and she joined me at that home. I have been trying unsuccessfully for years to have Mademoiselle Sorel, her name inscribed in the Avenue of the Righteous in Yad Vashem. Now everybody knows that Yad Vashem is a museum just like this one, except it's on steroids. <laughs> it's located in Jerusalem and its task is to perpetuate the memory and the lessons of the Holocaust for future generations. The children's home was a grand old house, surrounded by large gardens. The property was also surrounded by a large iron fence and a large gate. It was four stories high plus an attic. Hardwood floors, high ceilings, large staircase, and many large bedrooms on every floor. I slept in a room with eight other children. Now, most of you know that Jews are either Sephardim, darker skins whose ancestry is from Spain, Middle East, and North Africa, or Ashkenazi with white skin and whose ancestry is mainly Eastern European. Now, I want to show you a photograph. This are the young Jewish children that were hidden. <coughs> Look how dark I am and how Semitic I look compared to the white faces around me. There I am here and this is my young sister. This is Mademoiselle Sorel. As you can see I was definitely Sephardic in these photographs, you can see how Semitic or dark-skinned I was compared to the other children. <coughs> I remember thinking that I'm a very special person because whenever uniformed soldiers in their black boots with big barking attack dogs came to the gate looking for Jewish children, I was immediately whisked or rushed away to the attic. <laughs> just in case the soldiers came in and searched the house. What a fantastic adventure that was. I was two, three years old. I was special. I remember being put in a false, in a drum with a false stop containing oil. The smell was absolutely horrible. I can still smell it today. The words motor oli or motor oil were stamped on the drum. 
the two letters O were drilled out, so it enabled me to breathe. Black pepper was sprinkled around the drum in case the dogs came near. Just imagine being cooked up in a 44-gallon drum the size of this lectern, just like here, just this size, in complete blackness for at least half an hour to an hour at a time, while Mademoiselle Sorel negotiated with the German commandant not to enter the property and search the house. I was ordered not to move or make noise. Unfortunately, sometimes the paper made me sneeze. <laughs> Very uncomfortable, especially when I grew taller. This happened regularly about once a month. To this day, I don't like walking into a dark room. I must have all the lights on in the house to my wife's great chagrin. She follows me around, switches them off. <laughs> I follow her around and switch back on again. <laughs> During my three years stay in the children's home, I saw a lady who I was told was my mother. I saw her twice a year. I don't remember ever seeing my father or a man. Welcome to my formative years. Saw my mother twice a year. I'm told that she survived by moving from one hiding place to another. Now, this is important. During the Second World War, Turkey and Germany had an alliance. My father, who studied law in Berlin, Germany, was able to get himself a Turkish pa passport because he was born in Jaffa, Palestine. At that time, it was under Turkish rule, if you remember, or the Ottoman Empire. It allowed him to move freely without wearing the yellow star with the word Yuda on it. It is my understanding that he negotiated the release of a number of Jews from prison, including my mother. Now, at the children's home, we were only allowed to play in the garden at the back of the house. It was like prison very strict rules. I remember very clearly the punishments I received when I peed in bed, which was often. I must have been three or four. I was draped with my wet sheets over my shoulders, had to stand in a corner for one hour, and the other children teased me. I don't ever remember experiencing experiencing love or affection. I didn't know I was Jewish. I had no concept of religion. I didn't even know what it meant to be Jewish. In September 1944, I was five years old, Mademoiselle Sorel informed my parents that my staying at the home would endanger the other children because of my dark Semitic look. I was kicked out. My father negotiated for me to stay at a family who owned a farm near Antwerp, and my sister Rose stayed with my parents. A man, who I was told was my father, picked me up from the children's home and took me to the farm. Think about it. A total stranger took me away from everything I knew and everybody I knew. Suddenly, I find myself at a farm. I had never seen farm animals, never saw a chicken, a goose, a horse, a cow, never saw any of this. The one thing I do remember is that the lady of the house, every week, picked up the chicken by the neck and with a razor blade cuts its throat and then perceived to draw the blood into the glass and started drinking the blood. At that time, it was the cure for anemia. Now we know that obviously it's not. Suddenly I realized what freedom was. 
One day we had a visit from a couple. They came with a little girl, beautiful blonde hair, blue eyes, five years old, dressed in complete white. And we were asked to go and play outside. So we went and played outside. We played hide and seek. She tripped and fell on the manure stack. <laughs> Screaming, of course, and crying. And she went inside the house saying that I had pushed her. Total betrayal. At lunch, they sat me at the end of the table on the left-hand side. I knew I was going to get punished. To my left was a grandfather's clock. I stared at the clock throughout lunch, didn't speak to anybody, didn't eat, and didn't look at anyone. I just looked at the clock, and all I remember is tick, tock, tick, tock. In fact, many years I've had nightmares, and the only thing I heard in the nightmare was tick, tock, tick, tock. As punishment, I was banned to my room for two days, again being in prison. I became more unruly and more rebellious. One day I wandered in the fields and stayed until dark. I heard the farmer call my name. I did not answer. The farmer rode his motorcycle in the fields until he found me. He picked me up, put me on the handlebars facing the front, my, both my feet dangling on, every, on, on the both sides of the, on the headlights, and sped and tried to touch or go through every pothole. I thought I was going to die. I was so frightened, I peed in my pants. This time I was banished to my room for three days. Again, it felt like prison. And since I was homeschooled, all my class books and notebooks were in my room. I was so enraged that I drew a cross on every blank page of my notebook. As punishment for that, I was slapped on the behind so hard I couldn't sit for two days. Finally, the war ended in 1945. And before I left the farm, the farmer wanted to teach me a lesson. He picked me up, put me on the dining room table, and said, jump, I'll catch you. I hesitated. And he said, don't worry about it. Jump, I'll catch you. Of course, I jumped. He took two steps back. I fell on the floor, and I hurt myself. And he said, the lesson I'm giving you before we part is never trust anyone. I was five years old. I remember thinking to myself, who are these people who say they are my mother and my father? I vaguely recognize them. I was very wary. Where are they going to take me? However, they showed me a lot of love and affection, and I wasn't used to it. I was confused. I felt much better when we got to the house in Brussels when I saw my little sister. The house was a three-story house. And it had a small front yard with a low iron fence. At the age of six, I was enrolled in school. And here I am at a singing cost fest <laughs> at the age of seven or eight. I even remember the song I won with. And it is Voulez-vous danser, grand-mère? Voulez-vous danser, grand-mère? Voulez-vous valser, grand-père? And so on. I won't bore you with the rest of, of the song. I remember coming back from school, throwing my school bag over the fence and running away. At that time, American tanks were still positions in the streets. And they threw candy at me. So I started dancing for them. The more I danced, the more candy I got. 
what a deal. I loved American soldiers. After a few years, we moved to Antwerp because my father wanted to be closer to his parents. And this is the photograph of my parents after the war. You can see how Semitic he looks compared to her. In Antwerp, we had a very narrow house that we lived in. The kitchen was on the first floor, the dining room on the second floor, and the sleeping quarters above that. And to get the food from the dining room to the, to, from the kitchen to the dining room, you had to wait, use a dumbwaiter. Now you all know what a dumbwaiter is. And you also know what's coming next. I persuaded my sister to join me in the dumbwaiter. And I started pulling the rope. And of course the damn thing broke. We were stuck in between first and second floor for three hours. My parents were not happy. I was enrolled in a French-speaking school. I hated school. Another prison for me. I only had one friend. He didn't like school either. And we alternated between being last or second last throughout primary school. <laughs> At that time, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in Antwerp and Belgium. This, by the way, has not changed to this day. This is a photograph taken two weeks ago on one of the colleges in Brussels. Nu Sam Eichmann. We are Eichmann. They couldn't even spell his name correctly. They forgot. They're referring to Adolf Eichmann, who played a pivotal role on the deportation of European Jewry and was responsible for the implementation of the final solution. I'm sure you all know that. He was kidnapped in Argentina by the Israeli intelligence, smuggled to Israel, tried in a court of law, and hung for crimes against humanity. I remember walking in the park after synagogue on Saturdays. I was spat on. I was punched in the face. And I was called a dirty Jew. But I survived. <coughs> Welcome to my young world. Here is a photograph. You have to see that. This is me. Look at how dark I am. I even look Asian. My sister Rose, my sister Claudine, and my younger brother Jackie. At the age of 13, I had my bar mitzvah in the Turkish synagogue that my father belonged to and helped establish. After my bar mitzvah, my parents sent me to boarding school in England, in Brighton, south of London, to try and teach me discipline. What a waste of time that was. <laughs> Back in prison, just like the children's home, too many rules. I was rebellious and got into trouble all the time. Punishment was as follows. Facing a corner with a white dunce hat on my head, student teased me, but I had to remain quiet. Think how that must have felt. On a dare, I took a bell in the classroom and rang it. I was caned on my butt and on the palms of my hand by the headmaster. At that time in the 1950s, corporal punishment was still accepted. I'm sure that there's a lot of teachers that would like it to be reinstated. <laughs> At the end of the school year, the headmaster asked my parents to take me back. Again, I was kicked out of school. Age of 15, academia was not in the cards for me, but my father wanted me to learn a trade. So he enrolled me in a three-year course to become a pastry chef and chocolatier. I will make you dessert, Filippo. Promises. 
<laughs> I remember always sitting at the back of the classroom. The first comment the teacher made to introduce himself to the class. He turned around and showed his profile and said, I quote, don't think that I am a Jew because I have a big crooked nose. Everybody turned around and looked at me in my dark Semitic looks. If only I could have found a little hole to hide in, I was immediately ostracized. I remember one incident, however, in the schoolyard, one of the student, students called me Chinese. I was so infuriated that I punched him in the liver area. He fainted, and from that time onwards, I was left alone. Now, pastry school finished at three o'clock in the afternoon, and I walked over to the ballet school where my sisters took lessons. I liked it, and I joined in. I started taking ballet lessons three times a week, and then every day. At the age of 17, after graduating from pastry school, I took up ballet lessons full time. Now, promise not to laugh. This is me at one of the recitals. Handsome, huh? I, had, I had hair. At the age of 19, I auditioned and was accepted at the Royal Antwerp Opry Ballet Company and performed on stage. Now, my mother came to see me all the time. My father never came. He, nev he didn't want his friends to know that his sonning, son was running on stage wearing tights. <laughs> Too gay. In 1963, I saw Rudolf Nureyev. I don't know if you remember him. I saw him dance on stage. He was the greatest ballet dancer of his time. I was in awe. His technique was absolutely incredible. His elevation and his ballon was outstanding. It was as if he was jumping on the clouds. Compared to him, I had two left feet. Oh, my arms were acceptable. I had beautiful arms, as you can see. Look, magnificent. Anything below the waist was horrible. <laughs> I was so despondent, and I knew I could never reach his standard, so I abandoned my dancing career. My father died that same year. He was 56, I was 24. Now I really had to earn a living. I could have used my pastry diploma to get a job, but waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning, baking, is not my kind of thing. So I became an apprentice to a diamond cleaver. Did not like bench work, so I started selling and buying diamonds. My mother did not like the non-Jewish girl I was dating and strongly persuaded me with a one-way ticket to join my younger sister in Sydney, Australia. Now, I don't know if you remember your geography. But if you look at Belgium in that little triangle there, continue down to Sydney, Australia, which is just here, 10,500 miles away. Do you think distance is enough? I left in 1965. I was 26 years old. At that time, no one said no to mother. In Sydney, I sold diamonds to the jewelers. I got married the same year to a non-Jewish lady. You must understand that because of the trauma of my early years, as well as the anti-Semitism I experienced, I did not want to be a Jew. I never dated a Jewish girl. I wanted to remove myself from everything that was Jewish. I expanded my business into opals, because that's the native stone of Australia. Mm -hmm. I bought rough stones at the mines, and I had them cut and sold them in Hong Kong and Germany. I traveled a lot. My daughter Kate was born in 1970. I was 30 years old. 
because I traveled nine months of the year, my marriage suffered and divorce ensued. At the age of 39, I moved to Hong Kong, but continued to visit Sydney, Australia, to try and see my daughter. Now, I expanded my business in rubies, sapphires, emeralds, and tourmalines. I traveled around the world eight times every year for 15 years. I was living out of a suitcase. I was doing diamonds, as you can see here. These are the opals from Australia, the black opals from Lightning Ridge, emeralds, sapphires, and rubies. That was my trade. Now, to give you an idea of what it means going around the world eight times a year, I started off in Hong Kong, which is just in this area here of Taiwan. Went to Japan, Osaka, and Tokyo. From there, I went to Bangkok, in Thailand and then over to India, Jaipur, Ceylon and Bombay or Mumbai at the moment. From there I flew to Germany, just there, and then from there to South America to Brazil where I bought the tourmalines in the Paraíba area, from there to Bogota in Colombia, from Colombia to Miami, from Miami to Cleveland. Now why Cleveland? Because I had a good friend there and he was my best customer. Uh -huh. Yeah, Cleveland, Ohio, would you believe it? <laughs> and from Cleveland, Ohio, I flew to Los Angeles, Los Angeles to Sydney, from Sydney back to Hong Kong, eight times a year. Now, in 1987, during one of my trips to Cleveland, my friend persuaded me to stay because he wanted me to help him grow his business. So I stayed. I must tell you that anti-Semitism is a worldwide phenomenon. Once I made up my mind to move permanently to the US, I wanted to leave my Jewish heritage behind. So I decided to legally change my name to Lawrence Allen McComb. You couldn't be further away from Marcel Fashler. I dated my first Jewish girl in Cleveland. <laughs> I was 48 years old. Eventually we got married. At the age of 53, I decided to open a jewelry only pawn shop in Cleveland. And it was only jewelry, and you know what a pawn shop is. Now we go to 2013 at the age of 74. I was invited to the 100th anniversary commemoration of the building of the Sephardic Synagogue in Antwerp, the same synagogue where I had my bar mitzvah. Government representatives were there. I had no idea of my father's involvement, nor his effort to grow the synagogue. And I did not know the respect he commanded. He never talked about it. I had no idea either that he was saving 80 Turkish Jews from being deported to the concentration. He never talked about that either. My father and I clashed. We clashed a lot. I never felt loved by him and we never bonded. It might have been because of my five years in the home. I always perceived him as a sybarite a self-indulgent man who devoted 
his whole life to luxury and pleasure. In retrospect, I should have been less judgmental. My mother, on the other hand, was a very loving and caring woman. Anyway, I sold the pawn shop in 2014. I was 75 years old. My wife and I wanted to leave the freezing cold weather of Cleveland behind, and we moved into the Naples area because we had friends in this area. I got involved with the Holocaust Museum here in Naples. And it's only then that I felt more comfortable using my birth name, Marcel Fashler, to give presentations like this one. Let me give you a few comments. The exterminations of Jews, gypsies, and gays during the Holocaust was horrific. By 1945, approximately, as you know, 12 million were exterminated. The World Watch, but did absolutely nothing to stop it until 1944 when the Americans came in the war. And then they said, never again. Pol Pot slaughtered two million people in Cambodia between 1979, sorry, 1975 and 1979. Most of them were the intelligentsia. Again, the World watched and did absolutely nothing to stop it. In the Rwanda Civil War in 1994, the Hutus slaughtered 800,000 Tutsis. Again, the world watched, but did absolutely nothing to stop it. And then said again, never again. In the Middle East, as we speak right now, Christians are being slaughtered and some beheaded by radical Islamists. At last, at last, the world is doing something about it. These are just a few examples of genocides or massacres that have been committed over the last 100 years. I, however, like Elie Wiesel, whom I had the honor to meet and speak with, we remain optimistic. We both see the world as a glass half full instead of a glass half empty. I implore you people, you have to make the power to make a difference. I urge you never to give up, to make the world a better place. Encourage both tolerance, understanding among people and nations. Never again. Never give up and never forget. Now let me conclude on a very optimistic note. Here I am with my late mother. She was a very strong and independent lady. At the age of 75, while living in Sydney, Australia, and without telling us four children, she decided to enroll herself in the assistant living a facility in Frankfurt in Germany. She moved there on her own. The facility was half Jewish, half Gentile. It had a kosher kitchen and a secular kitchen. It had a synagogue and it had a church. I visited her often. The picture represents her optimism of life. She loved her hot dogs or frankfurters. <laughs> Even after all the horrors she went through. Thank you for listening.